Hey everyone, this is Ken Klippenstein, reporter for The Intercept, and you're listening to Goddamn GameCube. Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Goddamn GameCube. Greg and Riley are your hosts today. Today we are discussing one of the most critically acclaimed games of the early 2000s, Eternal Darkness. This game is frequently cited as not only the best GameCube game, but one of the most influential games in gaming history. And before we start, I want to introduce our guest panelist today. Ken Klippenstein is here with us. He is an investigative journalist primarily focused on matters of national security. He currently reports for The Intercept, though he previously operated as a correspondent for The Nation, and his work has appeared in other publications such as The Daily Beast and Salon. Ken, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. Good to be with you guys. How's now, your sanity uh, meter today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. That term entered into my lexicon. I use that during, I just casually, like during 2020 with the lockdown and everything, I remember um, commenting to my wife that my, my sanity meter feels pretty loaded and she doesn't know about the game. So I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> I should a give her a primer. Yeah, right. That That's a great bit. Um, so before we get into the game, it, this so this anecdote is funny to me. I don't, Ken, I don't know if it's funny to you. The story of kind of how we got connected for you to come on the show is humorous to me. Uh, so I remember, um, I think you had you had tweeted out something about Eternal Darkness, how I think you said it was like one of the best examples of like Lovecraftian horror or something like that. I said the and, best adaptation of Lovecraft. It's been a frustration of mine that there are so few, in my opinion. Uh, there were just, you know, I, I grew up playing this game and then reading Lovecraft and realizing that they, you know, drew from the same um, uh, 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 mythos and wishing that there was a better adaptation of it. And I haven't found a better one than this. Very interesting. So I, what I find funny is I, I think we kind of went back and forth on Twitter and then I was talking to Riley and our other crew members and I said, I'm just going to call him. Like maybe he'd want to come on the show and do it. And I think Riley had like made a joke. He said, you know, Ken's probably waiting for like, you know, Trump indictment news and other stuff. And it's just me on his voicemail being like, dude, do you want to come talk about eternal darkness? Like on his <laughs> office line? Oh, are you kidding? I'll talk about GameCube games that should have gotten more credit anytime with anybody. Dude, let's it's go. It's so funny because I was like right in the middle. I think we were, Greg and I were both in the middle of playing it for the first time. And then I see someone talking about eternal darkness on my timeline. I'm like, wait. Wait, what's going on here? But uh, I'm, I'm glad you're a fan. Yeah, I had a lot going for it. I mean, again, I, you know, I studied literature in college. And so I'm like pretty familiar with the like um, time in which Lovecraft was writing. And it's always been a frustration of mine that he'd never really entered the canon because he's written off as sort of, oh, this is horror. We'll take this stuff seriously. And in much the same fashion, because of that, I don't think that it's been there's been a very serious effort to adapt it into film you know, other parts of the culture. And so yep. I, I do actually feel pretty strongly about this game. <laughs> right on. Uh, so before I kick it to Riley to get into the nitty gritty of the game, can you tell us about your history with Eternal Darkness? You have a little bit like, how did you find out about it? Like, when did you play it for the first time? That kind of thing. Yeah, when I was growing up, my group of friends, I remember there were different like um, factions. There were like the PlayStation kids and there were the Nintendo kids. And and I was the, I was a Nintendo kid. And a frustration of uh, like ours was kind of like, you know, like I, I really liked Nintendo, but it was kind of like, man, I wish I'd have a little bit more like, uh, I mean, we were still just teenagers then, but we were like, I wish there was more like uh, grown up content or whatever. And obviously that's how they try to brand this game, but playing it, boy, did they hit the mark. I was so spooked by it as a little kid. And a lot of it was inchoate because the ideas that he's communicated, they were communicating uh, borrowed from Lovecraft pretty heavily. Um, you know, it's existential horror. It's not jump scares. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah an atmosphere. I mean, if you read Lovecraft, it's so setting driven. Yeah. Not, not only are there no jump scares, um, if you look at it, there's very little dialogue. Dialogue must be like a fraction of a percent of what he's right. doing compared to so much fiction today where it's extremely plot driven and dialogue driven and things. This was just like pulls the rug out from under you because it's so different than what you expect. Um, so it really left an impression with me and I didn't realize exactly what it was. You know, this idea of like powerful forces um, guiding things behind the scenes like as a kid you're you're kind of like seeing these ideas in the game but until i read lovecraft later i didn't have that aha moment of oh this is what they were getting at and it just right. i don't know it really stuck with me in an indelible way got it uh, so riley before you take it away just that that pinged kind of a question in my brain did either of you play the director's previous game legacy of kane or no i did not i didn't okay uh so riley let's um let's go right into the game so you take it away let's do it 
Sure. So uh, for any listeners who may not be aware, uh, Eternal Darkness colon Sanity's Requiem. Uh, I would describe it as an action adventure game uh, with has some uh, puzzle and survival horror elements uh, developed by a studio called Silicon Knights, which I believe is no longer in existence. And it was published by Nintendo in 2002 for the GameCube. This was, I believe, their first M rated publication, which is, you know, kind of what you were saying, just getting a little bit more grit uh, into the catalog there. Um, notably, the game was originally developed for the N64 and was approaching release readiness in 2000. Uh, but as Nintendo had begun to pivot to the GameCube, many aspects needed to be fully redone or retooled, including like the rendering engine, uh, the art assets, the sound and the dev tools. So there's quite a lot of that. It seems like a huge pain in the ass. But um, that basically, so the overarching story here uh, kicks off with a young woman named Alex Royvis uh, returning to her family's mansion in Rhode Island after her grandfather Edward is found murdered there. Um, when the detectives uh, come up empty, empty handed, Alex decides to investigate the death herself. Uh, searching the mansion for clues, she uncovers a secret room in the basement and a book uh, bound in human skin called the Tome of Eternal Darkness. So the the vibe I was getting here is that the Tome of Eternal Darkness is essentially like when you check into a hotel and you sign the guest book and it's that, but it's over the course of 2000 years. And it's essentially so there's uh, multiple different protagonists, 12 different people from various backgrounds all over the world, and they kind of have to work together over time to vanquish this dark god that threatens to, you know, destroy humanity or whatever. So we've covered actually a couple other games that dealt with Lovecraftian horror, but this one, as as Ken was saying, maybe the purest embodiment of it. Um, I, I want to actually start with Greg here. Like, how do you feel about Lovecraftian fiction, and what are some of your other favorite works of this subgenre? If so, now can I? I'm going to say something that's either going to be very funny. You guys are going to roll your eyes. Like, okay. I've actually never read Lovecraft, and this is this might have been my first experience with it. Unless there's been a game I've played where it is that, and I don't, and I wasn't aware. I would call Bloodborne Lovecraft. Oh, okay. That's yeah, kinda, that, that, you know, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. Ken, did you ever mess around with Bloodborne? No, I didn't. And maybe I should reserve my my judgment that this is the best adaptation because I've heard good things about it. It's 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 pretty solid, I think. But there's there's some of the same ideas going on there. But do you have any? Does, do you have like a favorite Lovecraft book, or do you have anything? I would else? say At the Mountains of Madness. Yeah, um, that's he's really just good. so. Here's the thing. It's seen as this kind of comic book science fiction stuff by the kind of stuffy part of the literati but the reality is i, I think he was synthesizing this um intellectual agoraphobia that must have taken place at the turn of the century oh yeah as, as a consequence of realizing how small we are in the universe science telling us not just literally how small we are but also um uh you know the departure from newtonian physics starting to realize that things are way less intuitive than than you know our sciences thought he he just you know, com communicated that so beautifully in a way that I don't think any other writer did at that point in time. So at one point in At the Mounts of Madness, it just, it's, it's a, so the book basically is about um, these uh, archaeologists going up to um, Alaska or, or the Arctic rather um, to uh, excavate. And so they're describing going just miles down under the rock and seeing just, you know, million, just, just millennia and millennia or just, you know, eons of 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 um species that that we can't even conceptualize so long and can you imagine having discovered that at that time and how much of a frankly mind fuck that must have been like yeah for, yeah you know exactly. what I mean? like, <laughs> and, and i remember as a kid having that exact same sense of agoraphobia and realizing oh my god everything you know being the sort of dominant species you you really it's hard to imagine you kind of they, take it for granted at yeah, first. Yeah, you know? exactly. And just like how small you are. And then the implications of that being that, well, someday we're going to be those fossils. And <laughs> I don't see any other genre that could communicate that than horror. No, it, absolutely. It's never taken very seriously. But I think it's really hard to do. It's kind yeah. of like comedy in that if your timing and atmosphere, everything isn't just right, it doesn't work. I've always thought yeah. it was one of the most difficult, you know, types of writing to pull off. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was going to say, too, um, you were talking about I was actually trying to think before the show is like, what kind of Lovecraftian movies am I aware of? And there's really not that many. And I think um, 
I think Guillermo del Toro at one point wanted to adapt at the Mountains of Madness, but he has like so many projects that didn't come to fruition, unfortunately. But there was an amazing feel- interview of him. He says, well, they said, why couldn't you do it? He said, well, the problem is we can't, you need a love story to get anybody to pay, to, to sell it enough to make it offset its costs. Sure. And that would just be so antithetical to everything that love. Yeah. Yeah. For, you know? It's, it, it wouldn't work at all. But, um, yeah, I just so I wanted to uh, invoke a quote here from the director of this game. I believe his name is pronounced Dennis Dyack. Uh, Video games were under fire for messing with people's heads at the time. You know, a lot of the uh, the Tipper Gore stuff was going on and whatnot, and and being accused of being murder simulators and stuff. So we thought, wouldn't it be a good idea to make something that really does mess with people's heads? And I think it definitely does in a lot of ways. So um, I'd like to kind of get into the gameplay and just just what what you're going to be doing kind of as you play this game. Very notably, this game features three different paths um, based on which artifact is chosen at the beginning of the game. There's like a red, green and blue one. Um, and this governs which god and its minions you will be kind of facing over the course of the story. And there is also this kind of Pokemon like rock, paper, scissors relationship between the three of them where, you know, red beats green, green beats blue and blue beats red. So what this means is basically that like when you're fighting monsters that are aligned with the red god, if you enchant your weapon, let's say with the blue magic, you do extra damage against them or whatever. So do you, Ken, do you recall at the time which one you chose or did you do it multiple times or like? Definitely try the different paths. I don't remember which one I first chose. Greg, which one did you do? Um, Okay, so if, if I fought red, does that mean I chose blue? I believe that's what that means. Is it? Okay. I believe so. I think so. I chose green and I was fighting green. So I think that's that might be the way it works. But okay. either way, you get gotcha. the gist. Um, I think so. There's a common conception that green is like the easiest path and red is the hardest. So considering I only played through it once, I can't really say how true that is. But I think it, may, it could have been made a little clearer when choosing if that was the case, because I wasn't really it was just kind of like, just pick it up. You, know, you just grab one of them. But I don't know. I didn't I didn't struggle too much when I played it. I mean, what um, I what I what I didn't realize was if you pick red, that means like enemies do more damage to you. If you pick green, enemies do more insanity damage to you. Yes. And then blue is I, there's some sort of magic minus magic or damage. Mag- yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't realize. I guess I played it on hard mode, but I didn't. It, it's not made very clear. It's kind of yeah. like the Resident Evil rock climbing thing. I guess you picked hard. Like, yeah. It, it, do you enjoy rock doing. climbing or not? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's uh, on that subject. The skeleton of the gameplay, I would say, is fairly similar to something like Resident Evil, where you know, you're walking around, you have an inventory, um, albeit unlimited in this case, that, you know, you have your weapons, your restorative items, and, you know, puzzle-solving objects. Um, and, you know, on that subject, you have three resources you kind of have to manage, which is your vitality, your health, uh, your magic, and your sanity, which is, is quite unique to this game. So um, these can be replenished by finite items, depending on the character. Uh, the recover spell once you learn it or a visit to the trapper area dimension. Can we talk about that a little bit? It's so weird. The trapper dimension stuff is really weird. Yeah. Like I've at, at first when I first started playing it, I thought the trapper thing was supposed to be like a punishment because it, so it sends you to this other plane. But I've read online that players use the the trapper thing as like a healing station like they purposely get caught and they because it, it, when you go into that like other plane you can there are these like warp pads that recover your, your stats so players use it as like a a safe haven i don't really get it like ken do you have a take on this trapper thing when you get caught by the little things and you get sent somewhere it's really weird but that's all i've got yeah it was just weird it's supposed to be like other plane of existence or something i think that you have to kind of like fight through to get sent back if i remember right is that yeah is that what it was yeah that's right it's, it's i think it's it's kind of testament to this game at times feels a little bit like a like kind of a, a tabletop game or like kind of there's some elements of strategy there where it could be a punishment because yeah you're losing like where you're where you were at the time and you can there's more monsters in this dimension and stuff but you can, if you plan it out, like if you need to restore your magic or whatever, you can just go there and use it that. It's like this weird like Mario Party board that you show up in. <laughs> and it's one thing that I, I did like about it um, is that a couple times you have to send stuff there and it stays there for the rest of the game, like a body and like an obelisk or something. And it's like, it's, I like that consistency. But 
Um, yeah, that's the, that's that uh, weird mechanic there. Um, I'd like to get into the magic system a little bit. Um, perhaps the most fleshed out aspect of the game. Um, there's uh, a, a handful of spells. Uh, they require at least three words to encant, and you have to remain perfectly still when casting them. Um, one of the words is always the god you're invoking. Uh, one is the action you're taking, like project, absorb, summon, protect, or dispel. And one is the object you're practicing it on, um, like the item, area, creature, or self. Um, later on, you can unlock five and seven word spells, which to the best of my understanding are always just more powerful versions of the three words. Um, and you can also discover a purple rune later on, which represents, I think, the most powerful god that's like above all the three others. Um, so over the course of the story uh, and millennia, each character will pick up new words and spell recipes that are recorded within the Tome of Eternal Darkness. A couple weird things about this I noticed. For one, like each chapter jumps around in time quite a bit. Like it doesn't say like, you know, okay, we're starting 26 BC and then like chronologically going each one. It does jump around a bit and it doesn't really make sense who has access to what spells at what time if they are writing it down in the book. And another thing was Greg brought it to my attention how funny it is that most of the characters seem very nonplussed that they can do magic now. <laughs> It's just like, it's not even addressed at all. I'm like, I, I'd have a few things to say about it, but yeah, I don't know. But what do you guys think about the magic system? Do you have any favorite or at least favorite moments with it? Or how do you feel? Greg, you want to start? Sure. So I, I think the cool part about the magic system, the more that I played it, I was realizing that uh, when your character is saying the spell, they have to say all of the words in the spell in order. And I, I it took me a couple of hours to realize what was happening, you know, because you have to stay completely still and yeah. your character is actually saying the incantation out loud. Well, then right. it's not their voice, but I thought that was very neat. I mean, it's also very annoying that like you get interrupted by everything, including <laughs> taking a step. Anything touching you also stops it. Yeah. Uh, also, like if I'm remembering correctly, you have to discover the spells, but you can also create them without discovering them. And it's not super clear. That's right. Um, and, you know, there you can also make the different spells different colors, but I feel like it, it got beyond me a little bit. I started sort of like, uh, what's Just the word? It. Just kind of um, uh, trial and erroring some of the stuff because I didn't understand what was going on. Sure. Like, Ken, do you have a take on the magic system? Um, I remember it being uh, frustrating, like how you were saying is interrupted. And I don't know if this is intentional or not, but much like I, I was a weird kid. I must have been 12 or 13 when I was playing this game, I think. And I remember, one of my favorite things as a kid to do was go and read the reviews of them for some reason. And then I remember they were dinging it on how clunky the like just aiming, like the character like aiming the gun or whatever. And, sure. Oh, sure. and much, much like that, I, I actually thought that that bolstered it because it felt kind of like a stress dream where it was mm -hmm. like you're yeah. kind of like, oh God, nothing's going right. And you can't, it just won't work. It won't listen to you. And right. I don't know, maybe that, maybe I'm reading too far into it, but in a way I felt like that enhanced the nightmarish quality that they were going for. You know what? One of our friends, Nick, uh, who has come on the show, uh, has talked about this a little bit where it may fall into this category where the spell casting being clunky and the shooting being clunky makes a lot of sense in the universe. Like if you're just a normal person having to cast a spell out of a book, of course, it's going to take you forever, yeah. but it, it doesn't translate to the gameplay being great, but it fits the story better. Right. Like none of you, like, I mean, this sounds ridiculous, but like you're playing as realistic characters. No one's a wizard. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's yeah. like, <laughs> it doesn't make, it wouldn't make sense, but it makes them sense. Some like in holding universe. a gun for the first time in their lives too. So it, yeah, it yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, for my part, I do appreciate what you mentioned a little earlier, Greg, about how you are able to discover new spells before you officially find their instructions um, by just like experimenting with the different words. Cause that feels very kind of Lovecraftian as well. Like, oh, I'm just like, I'm, I'm concocting something. I don't even know what the effects are going to be. And, and for better or worse, it's going to happen. But, um, the best uses for me, there's a couple, uh, notable moments where you, uh, learn like the enchant item spell in the past and in the future, you use it to repair like a broken key, which opens up a room in the mansion. I was like, when that happened, I was like, man, this, this is some good, good ass game design here. Mm -hmm. Um, and the bind spell as well, where you can learn how to like pit enemies against each other. I always love that. 
I did feel like sometimes when you have to use the um, it's like reveal invisible or whatever, because it always feels like kind of like what you were saying, where it feels like the last option I tried when I was stuck. Like, I don't know. Fuck it. I'll just cast reveal invisible and see if it mm. does anything. Kind of trial and erroring some of these puzzles. Like, fuck it. I guess I'll cast blue invisible. I don't know. Like, yeah, <laughs> just exactly. Give it a shot. <laughs> And there's a couple where you need to summon like the trapper, the little bug creature and use it to warp stuff out of the way. And I didn't realize at first that you have to aim when you're doing that. And I was yeah. like, what am I doing wrong? Um, but I don't know. It's overall a, a very interesting uh, set of mechanics. Um, getting into like uh, the sights and sounds a little bit. Um, Greg, you want to start here? How do you feel about this game's uh, music and art direction? So I think when it when it comes to the aesthetic stuff, this this correct me if I'm wrong. Is this 2002? It is right when this came out. So what I think is this game came out like between the Resident Evil One remake and Wind Waker, which yeah. are arguably the two best looking GameCube games that there are. Yeah. So I think this game kind of hits the middle point. I don't think this is it's not the best looking like GameCube game. Like I think that's Resident Evil One. Some people would say Wind Waker, but I think for for the for the time period that this came out the guns are very impactful like it, it's very loud and very Sounds, punchy yeah. and i think we'll get into the uh the sanity meter effects but the way they they muck with your perception of audio at times is very interesting you know the screen uh the game muting itself and um cutting off all the high end and making it uh making it feel like you can't hear anything is very interesting yeah. um awesome. but you know i but visually like character models poly count it's kind of middle of the road like there yeah. are better looking GameCube games, if you ask me, that came out at that time. But also worse ones, I would say. <laughs> oh, for sure. Ken, how do you feel? Yeah, I agree. Technically, it wasn't the best executed, like what we were saying about the mechanics and everything, but it was such an ambitious game. Like um, mm -hmm. oh, if yeah. you look at the mechanics, you could find a lot of these mechanics in different games, but never all in the same one. So it's like, look at Resident Evil, for instance. That's just a straight shooter. You could focus all your attention on the dynamics of a shooter. That's a lot easier, or not shooter exactly, but you know what I mean. Um, but then they're incorporating like the the rock, paper, scissors, magic stuff. And then all this weird, it's just like a lot for such an early, it just seemed very, um, what's the word ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. Ken, you actually brought something up that I was going to talk about next. So I'll, I'll touch on it now. Like I had in my notes here that the gameplay of this is kind of like Resident Evil meets Mist meets Alone in the Dark, but it has an RPG magic system, which is a lot of weird things to put together. Right. And somehow well, I mean, it kind of works like it's weird, weird is a great <laughs> word for it, which is I love that because that's what they called. That's what that era of fiction is called. That's what it's grouped into. Weird fiction, weird fiction coming yeah. from the coming from, I think, Shakespeare, the weird sisters. And it's just like right. this kind of it, it's like a little bit askance. It, you know what I mean? There's something weird about it, but it's difficult to put your finger on. And I can't think of a better way to. It has that like like X factor kind of like it's like yeah. something about it. Yeah. Greg, did you have more to say there? Yeah, I, I think you guys are correct here where I, okay, it's clearly a Resident Evil 1 inventory system. You're solving puzzles, you're putting objects down. But when I think about it, I'm like, what game is this game closest to? Nothing. But I don't know if you guys have any familiarity with like Parasite Eve, if you guys no. had ever played it. That is a Resident Evil clone, but it's an RPG where you level up and have stats and it's really okay. weird. That's the only thing where I could think of. It's a Resident Evil inventory system with an RPG magic system, which you're I've never seen before or after. So even yeah. though it's not the best at any of those things, it's so bizarre where it's very I, I said in the intro, it's a very like historically significant game for many reasons, and it's probably yeah. the the coming together of all those things in a way. Can you imagine what the business people were saying? Like, you pick a lane, man. You right. gotta sell this thing. I'm gonna guess there was no pitch for this game. This game was, hey guys, Legacy of Kane sold really well. I'm the guy. Nintendo wants an M-rated game. I'm the guy. Let's do it. I'm gonna do whatever I want. That's right. what it looks like. I mean, you could never get this game greenlit, right? Like, now. hey guys, it's it's a horror game, but there are no jump scares, and there's a magic system, and I, no one, none of our fans have read Lovecraft, but we're doing it. Like, right. okay, like. <laughs> Okay, it, man. It is crazy that it even happened. I, I would yep. say that I think aesthetically, even if if fidelity wise, it hasn't held up super well. I do think the art direction is pretty strong. I think the sound and music are are effective at, at creating the atmosphere. At least there's that that very um, intense track that's playing anytime you're in the mansion. It's like feels very you know just ominous and and oppressive. 
Um, I did want to ask too, um, maybe start with Greg again here. What did you think of the voice acting for its time? Did you think it was satisfactory? Anything jump out at you or? So I, I think voice acting in 2002 is tricky subject because it's mostly poor, not in this game, but it's mostly poor industry wide. Industry wide, yeah. Industry wide, it's pretty poor. I thought this game, again, like if I have to compare it to what came out around it, which is Resident Evil 1 Remake and Prince of Persia Sands of Time, this game is a, is better than Resident Evil 1 and at times better than Sands of Time as well. I also think for the kind of content they were trying to make, I think they tried. And I w let me say this. I think I have a hard time getting into uh, like otherworldly plots or like things that aren't grounded in realism. So I think the better voice acting moments are probably like Alex modern day. I think those are a little bit better when you get sure. into like when you're in like ancient Persia and stuff. I think it's a little bit wonkier, um, but I, I think it's better than what you would expect from a 2002 game. But that's yeah. And Ken, do you have any more on that? That's what I would say. Something that was just breathtaking to me when I played it was how seamlessly they transitioned from um, what was the Roman centurion uh, general's name? I can't remember his name. Oh, Pius. Yeah, Pius, yeah, Pius speaking Augustus. in Latin, and then it slowly, if I remember right, it slowly transitions, transitions into English. Mm -hmm. And I, again, as a kid, being impressed by it, thinking like uh, that makes you think about the passage of time, where we inhabit, you know, like a, a dead language. We're basically Rome now. How long will we be the dominant language? Blah blah blah. But then, as I got older, that you later you read. Um, uh, I think in Ulysses, the James Joyce novel, he has the exact same device. And so in retrospect, as a kid, I'm basically consuming like art and not realizing that that's what it is. And in retrospect, seeing how many, how much was borrowed from, from literature, from, you know what I mean? Like, it's really thoughtful. And so, so that's one thing that stuck with me. And then as for the voice acting, I can't really remember, but what I appreciated about it, again, none of the mechanics were particularly well done individually, but what I appreciate about it, you mentioned before them a national security reporter. Yeah. You know, the Pentagon spends a lot of time on what's called grand strategy, making sure that our strategy in Asia and our strategy in South America, our strategy in the Middle East, that it all coheres. So I would say that in the if you break down the individual points, none of it is particularly impressive on technical grounds, but it all felt so the gestalt was very convinced. It seemed like right. um it was all uh, coherent whereas games now it feels like you have different teams working on different things and it doesn't feel like it's all they're all on the same page if that makes sense or at do least you think the games that i've tried playing do you think better than the sum of its parts is not a bad exactly word? yeah um actually now that you brought that up that's a good point too where it starts in latin and the subtitles are in latin then it goes to english i forgot about that so that's a good point something i wanted to bring up riley before we move on too quick uh, something that actually really impressed me was how all the, the weapons and items are time period and area appropriate, which Correct, I thought yeah. was really cool. Um, I just don't want to go too quick over that because that jumped out to me was mm -hmm. where, okay, like if when you're like in early, I think early 1900s with like a World War I reporter, you have a Wembley revolver, which is very, right. you know, time period specific. Like Augustus has a Gladius and it's really right. neat. And I loved how, how do I put this? The game tried to do a bunch of different gameplay, but the gameplay was identical the whole time. And yeah. it, cause it made it period like example. Um, uh, what's the, uh, I think it's the second character you play as, uh, uh the uh, woman Elia? is Ellie. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And she has like a, like you get like a blow dart gun or something like that, which I, yeah. they did a really good job with that kind of stuff. I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it also, um, there is a detailed description of each of them when you go yes. through them. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's very, you can tell they, they did their homework, which is not the case uh, for all games. There's so much fidelity to the spirit of what Lovecraft was, because I think what they're driving home with this pa grand passage of time is reminding you how small of a place that we inhabit, even within humanity, not yeah. forget about like, you know, organisms on Earth, right, even in humanity. And it just just this sweeping thing from from you know antiquity to to modernity, um, it's just such an ambitious game, you mm -hmm. know, for sure. It's, um, it's insane. No, Riley. Before you continue, last point I wanted to bring up. We're gonna get into a lot. What I really liked is how each character actually has individual stats, and there are some hidden stats. Like, yeah. did you look into this at all? Because I went all in into this kind of stuff. I noticed how some characters were faster than others, or, you know, obvious, the most obvious stuff is that their meters are, are clearly different. 
um, for like health and magic and sanity and stuff like what, that. What but, I thought was really cool was like the character's running speed is a hidden stat. You can't look at a number, and also the amount of stamina you have when it comes to swinging a weapon or go or like committing to an action is also hidden. So some right. of the more physically capable characters can swing a weapon over and over while the other characters can't, which I right. thought was very thoughtful. Yeah, continue with uh, the next uh, subject. No, I, I just wanted to put a button on that. And, and for as far as the voice acting um, and performances go, um, I think it was pretty successful. I think you said, uh, especially regarding the content that they had to perform for, for its time, considering a lot of, you know, uh, voice acting in video games was very, for, for better or worse, gamey, you know, unless besides like Metal Gear Solid or something like that. it's There's some a little bit more uh, advanced concepts in this one. And I appreciated that, you know, for its time, they did a decent job with respect to the language as well. I think that's a great because, oh, my God, I had such a such a good time watching recently that Chernobyl show and that my one gripe was that it was all in English. And I was like. This Eternal Darkness did it better where you have them start out in the native language and then it, you know, it's like it's just presumed that 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 this is what everyone everyone is speaking their own language over the course of the game and like you get the gist, right? So I thought that was cool. But um yeah, moving on a little bit, um perhaps one of the most famous aspects of this game is the role of the aforementioned sanity meter. So as it lowers, uh, certain hallucinatory events will begin to occur. Um, these manifest in a variety of ways, both auditory and visual. Um, the camera in particular will develop a little bit of a, a cant and, um, you know, it'll kind of shake and try to write itself as if it's alive. And you'll begin to hear, you know, weird sounds like screaming and crying. So um, maybe starting with Ken, uh, can we talk about some of our favorite sanity meter uh, incidents? Do you remember any in particular? Um, one of them that I remember was um, the the protagonist alex committing suicide with a shotgun and then oh, you're wow. sitting there like wait hold on no i'm not doing that and it's like <laughs> right maybe it was because i was a little kid but it was like it was genuinely kind of like um disorienting yes. yeah because uh, sometimes you thought maybe you did something wrong and you were wondering what was causing it you know right I, I there's a similar moment too i think you're playing as kareem i don't remember but uh and if you have low health and you cast a healing spell your character will just get sawed in half <laughs> and then he'll come back to life i was like what like i at first i was mad i was like dude come on like it because my sanity's low is it a game over it's not it's, not, it's yeah. just there's a really would have killed it dude there's a really mean one where it tells you when you go to save your game that it's going to delete all your save data you remember this that's the, that's yeah. the cruelest one that's, that's like so, oh my god and do you guys remember how some of the paintings in the mansion will change where yeah. like yeah look some of like, the, they look like very sinister. normal yeah, they'll look more like devilish and sinister, the, the yeah. lower your sanity is, which is very neat. Yeah, um, I had a couple, uh, if you guys don't mind, sure. um, that were, were my favorites. Um, I think my my all-time favorite is, uh, this, this is just like my Looney Tunes brain. I find stuff like this really funny is where uh, Alex was walking around the mansion with a low sanity meter. And every time you walk through a door she got caught in a loop and she got smaller and smaller every time i'm like wait when is this gonna end and she's like she's like very very small <laughs> at the end but it's i love that um similar to what you were talking about there is one where if you um reload a gun it accidentally goes off in the middle of reloading it and like shoots you in the stomach and you die i was like oh my god yep. that was crazy um there's one where you your character will gradually start sinking into the floor like it's yep. quicksand and like your just head is poking out um the uh walking into some rooms and they're upside down i like that a lot yep. it's like really really disorienting and the do you remember like the 90s style uh mute level like you're turning down the tv with your remote yeah. yep yeah. that's a good one too that's i fell for awesome. that one and i also i can't it's embarrassing how many i fell for because i should have caught on at a certain point <laughs> there was like the flies a fly was like walking across the screen and i yeah. remember like, going up to the screen being like god damn fly get the thing out of there and then realizing it was like in the game yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> that's oh that's a good one too yeah, there's there's a couple like kind of Hideo Kojima, like Metal Gear stuff going on. I think yep. um, another favorite was um, I, I, there, I get to a loading screen and there's it just says, thank you for completing the game. Please look forward to the sequel, uh, Sanity's Redemption. <laughs> there's yeah. like a fake logo and everything for it. Just unbelievable. 
Um, so this, in general, uh, speaking, the, the sanity meter uh, system was actually patented by Nintendo in 2005. And um, during development was subject to uh, a lot of scrutiny on their part, um, presumably because they were concerned people would genuinely believe like their hardware was faulty or their and like you know in in the process of trying to troubleshoot it inadvertently damage their actual hardware so yeah i think it's like the save game corruption thing is like that's how far you can take it but yeah <laughs> other than that um so if it's all right with you guys i would like to get into the story super quick um again this is going to vary based on like which path you took and everything but i'm going to try to keep it pretty lean I'm just going to go through each chapter and and just kind of very briefly summarize what each one is about and we can kind of give a, a thumbs up or thumbs down to each one if you if you feel compelled. Um, so uh, let's get into it. So pretty straightforward. Um, after that that intro I mentioned earlier with Alex finding the Tome of Eternal Darkness, uh, the first character is the Roman Centurion Pius, uh, who is tasked by the Emperor with finding an artifact. Ultimately, this binds him as a servant to one of the, the gods uh, that we mentioned earlier. And he appears in various cutscenes, therefore, as like a primary antagonist. Um, thumbs up or thumbs down on Pius? What do we think? I think it's thumbs so I, I think. OK, let me say this. I thought the scenario was fine, but yeah. I, what I, I always games. I like when games are smarter than me because right. this game did this and Heavy Rain did this, too. I can't believe I'm saying Heavy Rain was smarter <laughs> than me. But, you know, that thing where like you're playing as a character, but you're actually playing as the villain, but you don't know. Yeah. yet. Yeah. So it did do that. And also, I mean, I didn't understand what picking the colored artifact did, but a pat on the back is the game. I didn't understand what the game was asking me to do, but good for them. Yeah. So, I mean, I thought it was fine. Uh, Ken, th thumbs up or down? Oh, definitely thumbs up. Yeah, I mean, also, like, you had mentioned the, the Latin to English. That was very smart. Him being lured away, and I think he was, like, a prominent general or something. He yep, was lured yep, away yep. from his uh, uh, retinue of, of other soldiers. Something about that is so Lovecraftian. It's, like, the idea that no matter your station in life, there are things more powerful than you that can, that can um, you know, hurdle you into chaos. And to time and again, really, really seeing this unfold, um, and I, I wasn't really even this this chapter, I think, is great because I wasn't really sure how to feel about it at first, because you all you really can do is swing your sword. And then at a certain point that, you know, the coin drops and you can do magic and stuff. I'm like, oh, this game is like actually pretty deep. So I would give my give that a, a thumbs up as well. Um, I believe the next one is is Elia, who is in 1150 Cambodia. Uh, who is a, a court dancer who uh, consumes one of the artifacts, the heart of Mantarok, and uh, becomes undead. A right, thumbs up or thumbs down for her? I have no opinion on this one. I thought it was fine. <laughs> and I, I feel like I was at the point in the game where I'm like, there's a giant eyeball monster. I don't understand what's <laughs> happening. Like, there's a blowgun. I don't, it's fine. I, it, I don't know. I, I think I'm, you know what? fine even though this is an audio only podcast so i will say uh i guess thumbs down because it didn't really bother me because she also like she also like doesn't really return to the story either like it it's very brief she does so, she has once but yeah it's like yeah. once next okay um <laughs> anthony in 814 uh france a messenger who reads a cursed scroll intended for his liege charlemagne and gradually turns into a zombie because of it so i actually have a lot of opinions on this one this may have been my favorite one because visually this is where the game uh, hit a lot of like Greg check boxes sure. that I'm looking <laughs> for. So like as uh, Anthony, like, you know, you like you read a scroll and then you start to see your face get grayed and you start to limp like your like your your skin is like falling off and your limbs stop functioning. What I think is really cool is like your character will start limping your movement speed is lower and also if you let anthony just stand around he will put a dagger through his hand and not feel any pain and he'll be grossed out about what's happening to him oh, man. if That's you leave awesome. the controller alone which i think is really neat there's also a really neat part about this you can't die in this scenario I don't know if you oh, guys really? know this no. because they they did this very clever thing where because Anthony he doesn't know it but he's becoming undead so if you run out of HP he will just stand back up at full HP which I wow. thought was very interesting. That's that's awesome. Thumbs up for me. Ken, do you have anything on Anthony? Oh, strong thumbs up because um again, another thing I'd learn in literature later, um just how grotesque 
It was. And and in the context of literature, grotesque doesn't mean gross or doesn't mean gross exactly. It means incongruous. There are two things that don't go together. And in the incongruousness, it shocks you. And that's what the this like undead zombie who was also supposed to be this man of God or whatever. As a yeah. kid, that really struck mm-hmm. me and, and stuck with me. There, I mean, there are a few scenes that are just seared in my mind. One is when the camera pans out and it's um, pious and it's just the 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 skeleton face, the the licking right. face, you know. Right, and then right, the right. other one was the the priest. I would say those are the two most memorable parts. That just, I mean, maybe it's old hat. Maybe it was just the first time I'd seen it as a kid. But just like wearing the robes, and then underneath it, it's like this undead thing of like yep, yep, evil. Yep. You know, it's like yep. really yeah. shocking to me. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. I to I, I give it a thumbs up as well. Um, two things about it. Number one, in addition to like the movement stuff you were talking about, I think his like you gradually can swing your sword a lot slower. Like it's like he's, he can't lift it as much as he, he can at the beginning, um, which I thought was a nice detail. And as well, kind of just this, how it starts, I think really plays into the thesis statement of, of Lovecraftian horror, where this, all this happens because this guy read a scroll that was meant for somebody else. Like he was pursuing information that he wasn't really you know, meant for forbidden knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I thought that it worked really well. Um, So next we have Kareem in 565 Persia. So he is a Persian swordsman who attempts to retrieve one of the artifacts from the forbidden city that Pius was visiting earlier uh, to impress his love. Uh, Greg, what do we think about Kareem? I mean, uh, I'm trying to make like a Prince of Persia joke, but I can't really find one. (laughs) It's it's not really Um, coming. (laughs) No, it's not coming. I'm, um, it's fine. You know what? It's I we're, we're very positive on the game, but like if I will levy like one critique at the game at this point, when I, I started playing as Kareem, I started to notice the gameplay becomes Riley. I don't think you agree with this. It starts to become kind of the same loop, right? Where like well, sure. you, it kind of, where, you know, you play as a character, you, you solve a puzzle by putting an item somewhere and it's resident evil gameplay. And I think with Kareem, nothing really stood out to me. Also, like, I don't know if this was on purpose, but at that point, the story, I didn't understand what was happening, but it it makes more sense later. Like why Kareem like chooses to stay behind and defend something like it, it took me a long time to understand why the scenario made sense, but I don't know. It was fine. Like, Ken, you have anything to add on Kareem? I loved it. Another oh, grotesque, okay, go yeah. ahead. Another grotesque case because <laughs> it's like an inverted love story. Yeah. And again, the same reason that Guillermo del Toro couldn't secure the funding for the movie, there has to be some happy love story. As a kid, that happy love story is this is that's what you've seen and everything. And then you see this thing. Somebody's in love with so and and wants to, you know, do something for his beloved. And then he ends up becoming this undead thing because of it. It's just like very um different than than what I had seen. And yeah. uh I remember thinking as I remember learning as a kid about um what was it? Like how praying mantis after they made yep, the woman yep, yep. kills the, I remember th- as a kid thinking, oh, this is like that game when I learned that. Oh my you know? God. Right, right. You know, like, you know, it was very creepy to me. You know what I also thought of? This guy really went above and beyond for her, huh? Like, yeah, he's, that's why, that's why I liked him. You know, I, I totally empathize. It's like, and, do um, you, do you want to defend this to the end of time? I mean, not fine. Like, <laughs> I, I guess. guess, I don't know. Because I believe been, his, his love is, is revealed to have been killed by the time he reaches the artifact. Yeah, and that's the choice that's presented to him at the end. It's it's kind of in the in the grand scheme of things, maybe not uh, as most most plot significant uh, a chapter as others. But I don't know. I think there were there were things to like about it. Um, so next we have uh, Maximilian Royvis, who is a an ancestor of Edward and Alex in 1760 Rhode Island. Uh, he discovers a hidden city beneath the Royvis mansion and attempts to warn the world about it. Uh, but is locked in an asylum after murdering his servants, believing they were monsters. Greg, what do we think of this chapter? So I think it's probably one of the better ones because it's very, very story specific. It takes place in the mansion where Alex is, so it's very obvious that it's important. Yeah. And I believe yeah. later in the game, you break into the room where he murdered all of his servants. Yes. I, I believe you do. So what? there's one part of this I didn't understand. Like, you can conduct autopsies on the monsters, but I don't think it does anything. Like, do you remember this? Only briefly, and I don't remember if it has any effect, but... Um, I, I do like how... How do I put this? He murdered all of his servants. You don't... And the game kind of has this... Because there's a sanity meter, he thinks he's seeing monsters. 
I'm not sure if they actually were, but in 1760, yeah, they put you in an asylum. Yeah. Like, you know, that, that seems about right. Right. Um, I, I think what I had said earlier, I think is kind of what you're ringing true right now. The gameplay is like area and time period specific, and they found a way to take all these like uh, time appropriate weapons and settings and make the gameplay symmetrical, which must have been difficult. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I really enjoyed this one. Um, number one, because I... I do think as maybe as the game goes on, it's the 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 sh the short uh, number of locations that you actually explore kind of hurts it. But at this point, I think it's really cool seeing the mansion in that era and how they they really pay attention to how different everything looked. They make a point of like there's an interactable like toilet and it's like that the, he thinks it's like the like the bee's knees like he's never seen anything like it before and it's like <laughs> it, all, all the furniture and everything is just completely different i love i love that shit but um i really enjoy it i mean because adding to that about the reasoning behind him killing his servants and stuff is that there is a type of monster in the game that either is like living inside people or pretends to look like people so that are in that chapter so it's it's tough to say like whether he was genuinely insane or not, but I, I liked it. It was a good chapter. Um, so Edwin Lindsay, who is a explorer in 1983 Cambodia, uh, he is exploring the ruins of Angkor Thom where uh, Elia was earlier. And uh, she, he like talks to her zombie and gets the artifact from her for Edward. Uh, do we, do we remember this one? Y yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of strange how like he's traveling with Augustus, right? And then Augustus kind of reveals like, no, I'm here to kill you. Gotcha. Well, that's that's right? actually a good point where Augustus continually in these situations shows up in disguise yeah. and is kind mm -hmm. of trying to manipulate uh, events and stuff. And um, I, I, I will say this, is he the first character in this order that survives his scenario? I think everyone else dies, right? At I least leading so. up to this. Or, well, Max gets imprisoned, but right um, yeah i think i so. believe so and like it, it, it's it's fine like i i just do what i didn't love i just didn't love that level in particular like the the it's like the cambodian ruin right? right it just wasn't my favorite like with the traps like elia wasn't my favorite with him it's not my favorite but i you do discover with it's interesting in his scenario i believe you discover the purple god uh it, but it's optional you don't actually yeah. have to do it right. so that's interesting like ken do you have anything to add on him I just thought it was kind of forgettable. It felt sort of Indiana Jones. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's literally what it is. Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I I I enjoyed like playing as him because he's he's got good stats and everything. He's got some cool weapons. It is a little bit of an Indiana Jones simulator, but it, I ultimately fairly forgettable. I think that location in particular not the strongest, but um, yeah. Uh, moving on to Paul Luther in 1485, France, a monk who is sent to the cathedral at Amiens to view a holy relic, but is detained there by the Inquisition. Um, he winds up uh, meeting Anthony from earlier, who is like a zombie now. He puts him out of his... You actually fight him. Uh, he puts him out of his misery and uh, discovers... Um, I think it's different depending on which 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 uh, artifact you chose, but there's a, a boss at this point that shows up and uh, uh i i really love this moment where it blows up his head that really <laughs> really uh made the chapter for me greg do you remember this one at all <laughs> sure so i thought the most impactful moment of this was you discover anthony and then anthony is still kind of speaking you, you yeah. guys remember he actually will like whisper charlemagne as he's trying to walk around and, and zombie you yeah um the, i mean i don't wait a minute does the boss encounter change a little bit because like when i was playing as paul and you get to the boss the boss just turns you into jelly he just stomps you and you you just get completely flattened yeah. into like so cranberry the, sauce the, bo the boss is something that that you um that you encounter later but this is the first like appearance i guess and i think it may change depending on which one it is because my guy's head exploded and i thought it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> um okay so contentious one here uh roberto bianchi in 1460 persia uh he is a kidnapped venetian surveyor who uh explores the forbidden city from from pius's chapter um so pius who is disguised as a warlord can build this like pillar of bodies in the desert um and at the end he is thrown in and buried alive greg what did you think of this guy 
Um, it, it, honestly, it's not my favorite scenario. Like playing as him is very annoying because I believe yeah. he has the slowest running speed and some of the slowest physical stats. Yes. And like what I didn't understand with this is so Augustus wants you to build it. Well, he doesn't really want you to build it. He wants you to investigate the integrity of the tower because he wants to build it. You, but like, why did Bianchi do this? Like, this, oh, like he Augustus, was, he was kidnapped, right? That's true. But like, you know, Augustus doesn't, you know, he doesn't come across as like overtly friendly or a guy you would want to work with. But Bianchi or, is, but Bianchi is, is he also like a rich architect from another country? He's right. From it's Venice. like, it's, it's kind of bizarre. He's from Venice and it's like a it's like a like a weird kind of architectural survey which doesn't necessarily seem to be something that that a god would be <laughs> concerned with like yeah i feel like if you want to build the thing you go ahead and build it but i don't know yeah maybe I, I missed I, something I, I don't know i um it was fine like ken do you have anything to add for this guy yeah the way you're describing it it sounds sort of silly like yeah like demigod <laughs> and, and he needs someone to do like landscaping for him or whatever or, or yeah, yeah. Some... <laughs> it's like you know i guess for all his godly powers he still needs like landscapers and architects and like well, guys see, he doesn't to... have he doesn't have fingers <laughs> that's <laughs> true <laughs> yeah. a little God. oversight on the part of the uh elder beings not to that... <laughs> develop that opposable thumb it's it's I, I just thought it was funny how like you're not actually building it he wants you to survey it for the integrity of it it feels like a very like municipal project like yeah, it's it, very it, again, being a national security reporter this sounds like the procurement process where there's like sixteen thousand <laughs> different things they need to go through and apparently even the even the demigods of the universe have to have to contend with these uh, bureaucracies it's like yeah dude we got to put this up for bid like if you could just you know give us an estimate <laughs> I, <laughs> I i guess like I, what I can say is, I can say this for a couple of the characters where I don't know of another game where you play as a surveyor, especially like during this era. And it's like, that's, I don't know, that's, that's kind of unique. I feel like they were, they're really just trying to get a lot of mileage out of these areas. And yeah. they were coming up with some interesting ideas, some less interesting ones. I, I don't know. I don't like playing as him, but it was, it was kind of memorable. Um, so I'm going to move on here to uh, Peter Jacob in 1916 France. So he is a reporter uh, during World War I who is stationed at the, the, the uh, cathedral from the earlier French chapters. Um, and this has been converted into a field hospital. Um, he has a boss fight at the end. And when he's done with it, he gives one of the other artifacts to Edward Roivis. Uh, yeah. Greg, did you enjoy this chapter? So I actually thought this is one of the scarier chapters, like where this game is a little bit more of a horror game. Yeah. Like, um, because you're in the church talking to people for a while and like the nurses like slowly become monsters, right? And you yes. and my, monsters really pile on you in some of these rooms. Yeah. Um, I definitely dislike this boss battle. It drove me crazy. Like I was running around this boss chamber for hours, just trying to time the spell correctly. And it drove me nuts. Like not to I don't know make a sanity meter joke, but like that, <laughs> like I I I love this section and then quickly hated it. Um, but it, it's one of the more yeah. story relevant chapters. I also want to bring this up. This game broke like a little bit of a rule for me. Where like why was Paul immediately turned into jelly by the boss, but Peter can get beaten up and tossed around, but he's fine. Like it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Sure. Like, I don't, yeah. I, I, I um I enjoyed the I don't know I it's it's a little uh I don't know um a little bit of an oxymoron but I I enjoy um World War One as a setting as as horrible as it is it's I I find myself uh, having an affinity for stories set during that time period and and what a a uh, cultural uh, global reckoning it was um, saying a lot about humanity and I think that in particular like how you know, I think the chapter is actually called the war to end all wars, which is what I, it was thought of at the time and how, as you know, it, how it affected the sanity of, of humanity as a whole. And I think it was really cool to have a chapter set during that. And also to, you know, there are some, some better than others where they repurpose this earlier area in a very historically, what I would consider historically accurate way by turning it into a field hospital for for wounded soldiers and you you hear all like the you know the batteries in the background firing and anti-aircraft and that kind of thing and it's it really like the vibe is completely different from when you're playing as like anthony or the other guy um 
and I, I agree with you, Greg, that the boss was pretty frustrating. Um, I don't really, because I think what happens is you wind up having to cast like dispel magic or magic, magic attack. I think it is. And I wasn't sure like how close you have to stand because it's, it's really like, I, it's, it's actually quite generous. And I was trying to get really close and it has like some minions that can attack you and stuff. And it's, it's, I mean, fighting a demigod can't be easy but it it was it was a little frustrating um so the next chapter is uh alex's grandfather edward in 1952 rhode island um who there is this invisible creature hunting down uh his servants which you have to track down and this kind of leads him to the hidden city that uh their ancestor maximilian uh discovered and there is this very um strange uh part where you have to essentially cast a nine part spell by going to these different like towers in a city and this winds up um wiping out pius's army and this is why he was targeted in the future by pius for for interfering in this way greg what did you feel about this chapter uh, so story-wise, it reveals why you're doing this in the first place. So it's very yeah. important. On mm -hmm. hard mode, this broke my balls, dude. Like, really? I, yep, because your health is lower. Enemies kill you in one to two hits. And oh, I, it was brutal, man. Like, I believe this character also has the lowest health maximum. Really? Uh, so, yeah, oh my God. Like, I hated this section a lot, but it does sort of reveal why he was murdered later. So it's plot vital it's plot crucial yeah um and you also see the city underneath the mansion and you explore it a lot and it may yeah. and so obviously uh you can't cut it uh but i hated playing it uh ken <laughs> did you have anything to add on the grandfather section yeah i liked it i just i feel like executing that idea of uh pious as this um you know uh guy controlling the marionette strings it's like harder to pull off plausibly than you i remember watching in college the transformers movie and they had or maybe it was maybe it was one of the million sequels and they show the transformers in the background when people are building the pyramids and it's like they were kind of going for that same thing but it just fell flat it didn't work when i was watching it i was just like that's fucking dumb <laughs> I <didn't laughs> laugh when I watched it. and then thinking of this game it's like no they executed it pretty well i thought i'll also say yeah that's a i'd say that's the sound bite of this episode um <laughs> yeah. I, I think so Do you guys remember that scene in the i don't maybe Dude. it was one of the sequels I th uh, I think that in two or three. I think I don't think it's the first this, one. They were trying to do that Lovecraft like humanity, you know, through the centuries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it just it fell. Fl I mean, it's like this big shiny mech suit. It doesn't work. You know? Yeah, just exactly. I don't think I saw that one. The last thing I remember seeing was uh, Shia LaBeouf. Spoiler gets killed and gets sent to uh, robot heaven. So that's <laughs> that's where I tapped out. Yeah, I, it was a little too much for me. I only but. remember him shouting Optimus really loud. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> put the cube in my chest yeah uh, um, um i don't know it, it, this chapter is i like the design of the city uh quite a lot i think it looks really cool um but this is it crops up again later it's a little repetitive when you have to go to these different like towers and like put mm -hmm. put a, a symbol and if i think if you screw it up you have to do it over again or mm -hmm. at least the ones that you got wrong um but overall i mean it was cool to see the reveal um, so the next one is uh, Michael Edwards, who is in 1991 Iraq, uh, you know, formerly Persia, uh, Canadian firefighter who is putting out oil fires after the Gulf War. Um, an explosion at one of these uh, leaves him trapped in the Forbidden City from the prior chapters, uh, which he winds up destroying using magically enchanted C4, <laughs> which I thought was awesome. And uh, later on, he meets up with Edward, and it's I think he gives him the last artifact. Greg, what did you think of this one? Yeah, so I thought this was a good example of how tasteful they did all the periods of time. This guy, it like I, th I remember laughing a little bit when I saw it, it said Desert Storm. I'm like, what yeah. the fuck? We're going to Desert Storm? Yeah, <laughs> like, okay. crazy. Uh, do you know what I will say this uh this desert storm chapter was much more enjoyable than the GameCube game conflict desert storm which was a really bad shooter <laughs> um so I'll say this like at this point I, I'm not saying I was tired of the game as a whole but I was a little bit tired of the gameplay loop I'm like okay we're doing this again and now I'm a guy with a bunch of assault weapons and we're blowing I don't know like it, it's fine I think this chapter is really just the this is the setup so Alex can get the enchanted gladius and 
Ben can get the last artifact. It feels almost right. like a like a, a way to a way to get us to like ten years closer to the plot. Even though Just filling filling that plot hole from earlier, like yeah, uh, I don't it. know. It's I think at this point I was tired of shooting red zombies with M4s and like <laughs> M16s. Like I don't really understand this, but sure. but it's fine. Uh, Ken, do you do you recall this one at all? It, it's fine. Yeah, I but, liked it because it was shortly. If I remember right, the game was a little after nine eleven. Yes, and this was like my earliest political recollections because it was just like total jingoism. Do you remember all the gold ribbons and everything? Oh, and yeah. everything was so flat and two dimensional. And it was like there's the good guys and the bad guys and everything. And then watching this and again seeing that get perverted and turned into this grotesque thing that was very different than what you were seeing. Cause there was total dominion by the news networks at the time. And so yeah. there was like one narrative being pushed at you and then watching this, not that it was like necessarily subverting that in any sort of political way, but just like, I don't know seeing. And then I remember asking my friend, I was like, what was desert storm? It's like, Oh, that was, <laughs> we were there before. And it's yeah, like, right. this history at that. Maybe, yeah. I, mean, I don't know how, again, maybe this is just through the lens of a kid learning about everything at the same time that it was happening. But I, I remember something about it. You know what it is? I think, cause I think all of us are in a similar age. I think what this, it may have been more effective for our age group. Cause I'm like, Oh wait, desert storm. This came, this game came out in 2002. It's a more recent political event that I know something about. Right. Right. We're like, if I'm, I don't know anything. Of, I shouldn't say anything, but my knowledge of medieval Persia is limited. Right. <laughs> sure. so, like, yeah. But my knowledge of Desert Storm, it's something I could more easily Wikipedia and like understand what that conflict was. Few, and so it, people it, who were involved are maybe still kicking around, you know, right, right. Like, how much do you know about medieval Cambodia? Like me is like not much, like not a lot, not a whole lot. Um, <laughs> yep. I think I think for my part, I, I really enjoyed this one. Um, you know, as you said, Greg, maybe the 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 formula was was perhaps wearing a little thin, but I thought it was great, not only because I think, you know, when you, you have this guy who is running around with with all this modern weaponry and stuff, it is does feel like kind of a culmination of all these different characters who you know you start out with all you can really do is swing a sword and then you know this is where humanity is at this point like you said it's the most recent and it's it's kind of it is a good kind of contrast with other games at the time especially you know the next i would say six to seven years was all you know kind of iraq adjacent like shooters dominating the market and stuff you know modern warfare and all that stuff but it was so triumphalist and and this game oh, is yeah. all about the humanity is losing and that was such yeah. an interesting counterpoint at the time because nobody it's just completely contrary to your expectations you know there are a ton of games where you're you know kind of a like a leather neck getting getting dropped into iraq or afghanistan or something but this is literally i can't think of any other game who that would even do this in the future where you have this um, Canadian firefighter uh, putting out oil fires uh, in, in after the Gulf War, which is I, I was completely ignorant of um, before I played this game because I don't I'm I know a little bit about the Gulf War, but not really, you know, the cleanup or anything like that. And, and the aftermath and it's it, 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 this game does kind of have that like Carmen San Diego effect where I learned a little bit more about about each era without, you know, like, you know, oh, that's that's, you know, something to, to put in, in my brain here. But I enjoyed it for the most part. Um, Greg, did you want to say something else about that? I was just going to say, like, we were coming up on the end of the story. There's only one more, right? Right. Let's go into that's the last little bit. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, this is where you you take control of Alex fully at the end. Uh, Alex Rivas in 2000, Rhode Island. So uh, she wraps up her little investigation here, uh, travels to the ancient city beneath the mansion and uh, summons the um, god that can defeat the one that you're facing against. Um, and you basically you do this doing the, the same thing that Edward did with the towers and, and putting in the symbols and stuff. And um, Following this, she has a final boss fight against Pius, where she is aided by the ghosts of some of the other characters. Um, and so once once uh, one god defeats the other, Edward kind of steps in and, and vanquishes the other gods so that humanity can can live on. Um, Greg, what did you think about this? I so I, I mean this in the nicest way to this game. I think I was all set with the gameplay loop at this point. The final puzzle takes forever. And I think this was this. This is probably one of the more gamey parts of the game where you have to fight this boss. If you have the enchanted gladius, you just swing at him. 
right you keep your, sure. your your buff spells on this is like i feel like this is like the gamers gamer moment of this game <laughs> we're sure. like i'm gonna get my buffs going I'm taking out my best stuff let's do this yeah. like it was kind of cute how you had to play as the ghosts of other characters and take swings at them you get a little little reminder of who came before you kind of like hey this has going been going on for thousands of years um before i kick it to ken i do want to say that um i th- i don't know how i feel about this where i feel like I'm, I'm torn between, I feel like the puzzles in the mansion leading up to this moment are kind of spoon fed to you. Like you go in, you can go into the observatory room so many times and do nothing with it. But I feel like in so many moments in the mansion, the next thing you do is, is almost told to you. Like, hey, you have the spell, go do the thing. It's actually more linear than I would have liked. Um, and there isn't a lot of, pu- there's, I feel like the puzzle solving as Alex is a little bit, it's, how do I put this? It comes across as more obtuse than it actually is. And then right. when you get down into the final part, I'm kind of I'm kind of all set with the gameplay. Like I kind of just want to see how this plot resolves and be done personally. Sure. Okay. Um so I mean Ken, do you have any thoughts about this final scenario? Final or I guess anything about the mansion, I guess, puzzle solving Alex's environment. If I'm remembering the ending correctly, something that was particularly intriguing to me was um this idea that humanity's only shot is when the demigods are fighting with each other. Yeah. <laughs> and again, much later reading Greek mythology, you realize, oh, that's like a you know, well established thing in 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 human literature. Yeah. But um it's again happening against the backdrop of this post 9-11 very black and white m- moral drama of like the good guys versus the bad guys. And then you see this much more cynical picture of how things work that I think comports more with political reality that there are factions powerful factions fighting with each other and in those moments that's when that's when the mere mortals can 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 tip the scales something about that really stuck with me i don't know why i I think uh i think uh chaturga is going to defeat zolotov in the next primary for sure Uh, (laughs) nice i think that's i think that's the way it's going to play out um yeah i i did uh, i i share some of greg's uh, grievances about the gameplay but i think it really kind of tied it all together when you have those other like ghost characters showing up and kind of feeling like like the crest of a mountain like of all this stuff kind of culminating in and this is this 2000 year journey really really finally paying off here um and i thought it was really interesting as well about how the bosses the or the gods rather they they kill each other in different ways where i think the chaturga the red one is the is the strong one so he just like rips the other one apart and then um the the magic guy the the blue one uh makes the other god kill itself or something and it's like i don't know it's like there's different there's different ways that it plays out and it all feels very um kind of in line with the the general lovecraftian ethos where you know you have you have these different kind of um levels of insanity and the way they're going to kind of play off each other the way they interact they each interact with pious is different as well depending on their personality so i think that's pretty cool like you know whether or not he takes an active role in in influencing events um i don't know it's it's like the, it ends pretty much as you'd expect but it is it to me it did have a feeling of satisfaction at the end um getting into kind of into the ending here um point of note i wanted to to mention that i didn't realize is that uh Royvis is savior spelled backwards so they, <laughs> they did a little they did a little tricky there I, I i appreciate that um do you guys have any other thoughts on the story uh as well as maybe the i don't know do you know anything about the secret ending once you do all three of them all I know is if you do the three paths, something happens, but I only did one. Like, I didn't, okay. like, Ken, do you know anything about, like, doing all of them and how it changes? I only know, it's just so interesting, because it's the first game where um, I couldn't beat it on the harder modes, so I didn't know, but I was curious to find out, and I went online to find out. A lot of games, it's kind of like an afterthought, right? Right. You, you don't really care what happens, it's just filler to get you between the action scenes or whatever yeah so I remember looking it up and, and being really interested in in how the storyline was described um which i think was that you basically end up destroying most of them and then there's only one left and it's like injured or something like that 
I think yeah. you're right. Like the purple one who dominates all survives, but or something like that. But you have to do essentially they're trying to do like the the three timelines thing, right? Where the three go. I don't know. It's some. I don't know, Riley. What do you got? You know, we're getting out of my realm of interest here with these timeline oh. plots. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I think I think supposedly so. All the all three of them are supposedly happening at the same time, um, just in different realities. And this has been. The, the entire uh, plot of Eternal Darkness has been the machination of the purple god because, you know, just to get rid of the competition or whatever and, and have kind of reign supreme. But it is uh, it's like incapable of acting itself. I think you said it's injured or, or weak or something like that. And so it's it's been putting all this into motion itself, which I think is kind of interesting. Also very uh, evocative of Lovecraft. I th- if I remember right, one of like 90% of his stories ended, you know, humanity's fucked. And then I think there was maybe <laughs> one, maybe one or two that were like ambiguous like this, where it's like they, they win the battle temporarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You've staved this off for now. Yeah. Kind of wrapping up here. I think it's fair to say we all consider uh, Eternal Darkness to be a very unique game. Um, I hated it. <laughs> we all hated it. Uh, don't play it. Don't even listen to this episode. Um, so, I. But beyond what we've already said, anything else you'd like to mention about how special this game feels, especially compared to, uh, you know, say the releases of today? So, do you want me to start? start? Yeah, I'll yeah. start. Um, so, uh, we're we're doing final thoughts here. Yes, Riley. Yeah. Okay. So, final thoughts. I think what was interesting is I think. It's always tough when you play a game for the first time, but it was from 20 years ago, right? Where I played Eternal Darkness for the first time a month ago. You know, I'm 31. I didn't play it when I was, you know, 12 or 13. So I think what's interesting to me is because I've played so many games that it took aspects from, I'm able to analyze it a little bit differently. Where the Resident Evil 1 remake, I've said this, you know, on the show so many times, like is one of my favorite games ever. And seeing how Eternal Darkness took the shooting and inventory, but also put a magic system into it, and it's also kind of like Mist, and there's an insanity meter, and it's time relevant, and everything is time and period appropriate. There's a, as Ken said a couple of times, there's a lot happening. Not all of it is the best execution, but it comes together to be better than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Like, I don't, it's not the best Resident Evil game. It's not the best action RPG. It's not the best Mist game. But it's also so bonkers and unique that you can't help but appreciate when it came out and what it did as a whole. Yeah. So I think, as if I'm remembering correctly, this game is very universally acclaimed. It has a high Metacritic score, but it didn't sell many units. Like this was right. not a, 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 what's the word, a commercially successful game. Right. Um, and also, this is the last good game that 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 uh, Silicon Knights put out, and then a couple of years later, Epic Games sued them and killed them, and now they're no longer a company. <laughs> So oh, Ken, I'll Fortnite leave you, strikes again. <laughs> yeah. Ken, I'll leave you with that. Like your your like final thoughts like overall about Eternal Darkness. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think it's clear at this point that I, you know, really admired it. And it was one of the first things for me that that made me realize, like what I was saying about genre fiction before, um, that the distinction between art and, and entertainment um in some cases can break down if if the you know creators are ambitious enough. And it's also a source of great frustration to me. Um, and it makes it hard for me not to have the grumpy lefty in me come out that they <laughs> raise money on this thing that is like universally beloved. I've never heard yeah. a bad thing about it from from any of the GameCube fans that I know. How could they not do it? And, and really, kind of like the point of the game, it only really was allowed to be financed because of this uh, rare situation in which the, the demigods were fighting, being Nintendo and the other companies. <laughs> Yeah. for market Good. share wow, and, that's and a, momentarily oh, momentarily saying okay we need an older people audience game yeah it doesn't have to be a money maker but just enough to say that that we're going to be making games for older people here's here's one rare opportunity you can have to kind of like just explore the palette and do what you want to do as artists you know wait a minute what you said was so funny i need to expand on it a little bit because there are four gods in this game right think about it at that time there was nintendo yeah. sony microsoft exactly. and Seg- sega that's what was still a company <laughs> i wasn't i wasn't being cute when i was saying that i think this co- comports with reality in a, in a certain sense right yeah like, in the kind of naive market view, it's like, oh, there's going to be a market for this game. It's like, no, it's they're going to be competing for market share before someone's established a monopoly, and then they don't care what anybody wants at that point. And so yeah. in this moment, 
the mortals can accomplish something great, but only in that moment. Yeah, you know? while they're all while they're all busy fighting each other out of self interest, you know, we can uh, we can accomplish wonders. Jesus, what but, a good uh, bow on that, Riley. What do you got, dude, to top that? <laughs> I, not a whole lot. I maybe um, if you guys could give this a grade, what do you think? Okay, so um, uh, Ken, quick breakdown. So grading system, we do letter grades like school. Uh, so here we go. I think. Here's, I feel like my heart wants to say A minus, but I feel I lean towards B plus because of how repetitive the gameplay is, but the game is so tasteful, it's hard for me to put it in that range. I think the Metacritic on this game is like a 90, which is like an A minus. I feel like I'm right there. Like maybe, you know what I'm going to do? Maybe you guys can sway me where okay. I feel like I want to say B plus, but I want to hear what Ken has to say and then what Riley has to say, and maybe I'll change. But Ken, could you go grade school on this? Go ahead. Well, I'm a little uncomfortable because I was grade school when I played it. And so I don't know, <laughs> like how you were saying that, you know that in any art, the different artists are in dialogue with each other. You can't look at one thing in isolation. You have to understand yeah. what is the context in which it's appearing? Who are they responding to? What are they borrowing from? I don't have a great sense of how much originality there was there. As a kid, it seemed extremely original, but maybe that's just because I didn't play many other, um, you know, horror type games or anything. But as far as I can tell, I would give it an A, but I'm definitely not a, I'm not a, I'm not a curator. <laughs> <laughs> um, Riley, what have you got? I wonder if, if you'll sway me. I'm, I, I didn't, I did not look at your grade beforehand. So what uh -oh, do you got? I've, I'm, I'm done putting those in my notes. I'm hiding them from you just so I don't, <laughs> I don't influence you at all. Um, no, I, 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 on top of everything we've already said, I think it's just, it's so unique. You would never see Nintendo greenlight a game like this for the Switch or anything like that. It's like no. you would at most see like a really, a really high effort double A indie production that, that could do something like this. You know, it's just like dealing with the concepts that it's, that it's addressing and, and all these different systems that are you know maybe some a little too obtuse but overall everything working together you have this incredibly ambitious story over 2000 years and how somehow the gameplay between all these different people is the same universal experience at its core i think is a very powerful message just in terms of overcoming you know the 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 forces of of eternal darkness as it were um, and I think uh, I think I'm going a minus on this one. What do you, th okay. what do you think? Sure, I think I I am gonna stay at B plus, but I'll give it the highest B plus possible, which is 89. Right. So right. I think I we tried. have we have we have all three A A minus and B plus. So Riley, do you want to take us to the end here? I think you've got what one or two more that we're gonna wrap. Yeah, I just uh, out of curiosity, could could you guys or would you even want a sequel or could you see it coming to fruition? What do oh, you think? I absolutely would want one. And I can't see one because of the market dynamics that we described before. Yeah, I just feel like this kind of ambition is not rewarded with the, the guest all that I was talking about before. The stuff that's rewarded. Look at the games. Photorealistic um, Call of Duty type shooters, which are yeah. amazing. This is exactly why I grade on a curve for a game like this, because the, the gestalt is never rewarded. What's rewarded is being an expert at one of these things instead of trying all 12 of them at the same time. You know, right. you know what I mean? And, and mastering one thing and making it perfect and really responsive and everything. So it's like, I, I want to go out of my way to give credit to people that try, that that incur the, you know, frankly, probably career risk not to do that because it's probably right. a pretty safe way to go. Just like mastering one, it's like playing Smash Brothers. You could get really good at one character. I always respect yeah. the people that know that are ambidextrous. And they can play a bunch of different characters, and that's what I right. saw in this game. So we're uh, so I'll, factually, we're not going to get a sequel because Silicon Knights got sued into being killed. Uh, they're bankrupt. They're toast. But also, I did want to mention, kind of playing into what Ken said, that there was a Kickstarter that failed. They just did not get enough funding, unfortunately. So there's some yep. like footage of it there was going to be kind of a similar thing with different people in different times but you know obviously that uh, the fidelity has increased significantly since then i think this was like 2016 something like that but it's a shame because i think like even a remake could definitely like like help you know the the awareness of this game i think it would help the gameplay hold up a little bit better it's a shame that that it's it will remain kind of this uh 
this piece of apocrypha, if you will. But, yeah, but we'll uh, get an, we'll get another we'll get another Transformers uh, sequel. We'll, we have more great. Marvel movies Marvel movies to look for. That's exactly why I want to give a game like this credit because look at yeah. what they do instead. It's just total risk aversion on everything. Yeah, it, 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 culture sucks because of it. I don't even play <laughs> games anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's all the same shit every time. Yeah. You know, it's like number 14 or it's ridiculous i don't even particularly dislike call of duty i play call of duty with my friends yeah. but it's kind of like can we have something different you know? ken ken fine a minus okay are you happy <laughs> <laughs> that's I, I think the last couple of years have changed me in that way where stuff that used to bother me i i, I respect the big swings more than i used to creatively yeah. ken we're gonna end with you well, so there's two last questions. So is there anything like, um, or where people can find you or something you're working on, you want to bring attention to people, that sort of thing? Anything uh, you want to say? Check out my Substack. I'll be posting more on there about subjects like this, like cultural stuff. Um, you know, I, all my reporting goes on The Intercept. Um, it's just kenklippenstein.substack.com. Um, and you can, I spend a lot of my time on Twitter. Say hello to me on there. We uh, That's awesome. We'll repost any links uh, in, in our descriptions and stuff like that. I appreciate it. So, so the last thing is it's a tradition on this show that the guest of the show intros goddamn GameCube. And Ken, you've got the script. If you could intro the show for us uh, when you're ready. Hey, everyone. This is Ken Klippenstein, reporter for The Intercept, and you're listening to Goddamn GameCube. Hell yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Riley, I'm wrapped on this. Are you, you done? You toast on this one? I got everything. Cool. Right on. Anyway, thank you, Ken, so much for being here. Uh, and this has been Goddamn GameCube, and we will see you all next time. Thank you very much.